Glenn Moore. Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'd like to stand and, uh, I guess, share a few of my thoughts on Bill 3 and the disappointment that uh, Albertans relate to me when I'm out visiting and talking to them in the various places and uh, visiting them in their homes that this government has failed for the last five years to be able to balance its budget uh, despite record revenue. I was just looking this afternoon, Mr. Speaker, at the revenue from our uh, resource industry, oil, gas, bitumen, land sales. And over the last seven years, I don't believe that it's dropped below $8.9 billion. It's been as high as $14 billion, down to $8.6 billion. It's been a, <coughs> excuse me, Mr. Speaker, a landslide of revenue for this government. And yet every year, this government uh, fails to be able to meet its budgetary expenses. And I can see in a few areas, perhaps human services, that we've had some tragedies, need to, uh, to address them. Perhaps in municipal affairs, again, where we've had some, some real natural disasters. Uh, and, and those are areas that, you know, that, that we can't always predict, but again, in good budgeting, you would uh, set aside that $300 million, $100 million for those different areas where we might need it. But to, to go through and, and look at some of them, I, I want to start off with the first one of the Legislative Assembly of $3.1 million. I sat on the committee when our Chief Electoral Officer came in to make his presentation requiring this extra amount of money. And, Mr. Speaker, this wouldn't even be in the appropriation if this government uh, and the Premier would keep her word on having a set election date. The whole reason why he came in here and the cost and the expense of the Chief Electoral Officer is because he has to be prepared because tomorrow or Monday this Premier could, if she decides, to call an election. And so it's his responsibility to have places ready to rent, people ready to go to work because this Premier broke her promise on setting a fixed election date. So we have an extra $3.1 million here in supplemental supply because the Chief Electoral Officer needs to be ready in case this Premier all of a sudden uh, wakes up and has a nightmare and thinks, I've got to go to the polls now, and off we go. Uh, very, dis very disappointing that this Premier wouldn't keep her word, give a date, uh, and the first one here in the appropriation bill wouldn't be in here if we knew it was the 15th of June, 30th of April, whatever it is. But here we are having to spend extra money, the frustration of people trying to be prepared and ready. Why? Because this government fails to plan, this government fails to be transparent, this government fails to be open with the people of Alberta, this government and this Premier fails to keep a promise. Very disappointing. Uh, intergovernmental, international and Aboriginal affairs needing an extra rounded up seven million dollars. Um, if we flip through and go to that in the book, excuse me, I got the wrong page flagged here, but we can go through line item after line item and ask why, why has the government failed to be able to properly allocate its funds, but even to be more impressive, Mr. Speaker, to actually come in under budget. Why is this such an impossibility for this government that here inter intergovernmental relations, the supplemental amount of $2 million is requested together with 500000 made available from the lower budgeted expenses and other programs to provide an increase of $2.5 million to First Nations Development Fund? Uh, I'm not saying that the Development Fund isn't great and that we need to have it, but the question is, is why can't we budget for these things a year in advance? Why is it with 30 days left, this government comes in and says we need this money? We need it, you know, 118,000 or 118 million for the First Nations Development Fund. Well, what, what is it <coughs> that it's actually presenting? We, we don't know. Uh, it would be very nice if these things actually came with, with line items and to say what the contracts are for and what they're trying to achieve. It was another one of the promises. In her mandate letter, the Premier says that we're going to be open and transparent. There's no transparency here, Mr. Speaker. There's no openness. It's, it's line item budgets for who knows what, what it's for. 
Uh, we go to the next one. Supplemental amount of $28 million is requested to provide funding for salary increases and pension plan enhancement for the Alberta Provincial Court judges in the Court of Queen's Bench <laughs> Master's Chambers. Uh, again, uh, a line item, not enough information there to be able to determine whether this government failed to budget properly or whether they were just unaware. And again, as my colleague from Airdrie Chesmer has pointed out so many times, the whole budgeting process, in my opinion, and in many people across this province, comes from the first act that this government did, the Premier included, was to go into member service and give themselves a nice big hefty wage and then to turn around to the rest of Albertans and say, look what a wonderful job we're doing. We are wonderful, pay us top dollar, and not be able to see the domino effect on what leadership actually causes. Leadership in that they lead, they take significant raises, and then those behind want to follow and ask for significant raises. They've lost all credibility to be able to deal with any of our numerous public servants because of what they gave themselves. And in most Albertans' eyes, they weren't doing a very good job, Mr. Speaker. They're actually appalled at the jobs that they were doing in many cases and very upset <coughs> with the way they pushed forward and, and took those. Municipal affairs, uh, looking for $17 million, I believe, is requested together with $523 million made available from lower than budgeted expenses and other programs to provide $18 million for the government-wide response to the wildfire in town of Slave Lake and surrounding communities. Okay. Here, Mr. Speaker, is a case where an unforeseen tragedy and needing some money. We understand that. But again, my question is, is why don't we have that fund in place so that we don't have to go through supplemental supply? Budget for emergencies. <coughs> but it's disappointing as we go through case by case. Seniors, supplemental estimate, $10 million. Uh, the amount of $10 million is requested together with another million made available from lower than budgeted expenses in the Affordable Supportive Living Initiative program to provide six million for the cost related to higher caseload growth for financial assistance to assured income for the severely handicapped. There's been many, many speakers here that have talked about the need of putting them first. It's kind of interesting, like I say, that they got this huge wage increase themselves, but yet we've waited four years before we finally have seen those on H and PDD received that increase. Four years they had to wait before they got a significant increase where this government again put themselves first and said that we needed it. But why can't they plan and budget for these things? Another one of the, the concerns that I have because I, you know, the total amount, what they're asking for, it's interesting that this Premier uh, was propelled to the front, I believe, largely because of a $107 million promise that she made just two weeks left in the leadership campaign and uh, went to Albertans and said, we'll restore the $107 million, which the Wild Rose spoke against from taking from the teachers because they'd signed the contracts. I mean, the current finance minister is the one who gave them such a lucrative contract five years ago, and then they didn't want to keep it. And again, we haven't even... A, a, a I'm getting the, the House leader over there, Mr. Speaker, uh, chattering, saying that that isn't so. It, it absolutely is so. And she also promised that they would take that $107 million from in-year savings. If we had $107 million of in-year savings, why are we even coming to supplemental supply? It's interesting, too, to even go back to her Bill 1, results-based budgeting. This is the result of poor budgeting. This is the result uh, of, of the sky's the limit. We have record revenue, and yet we have uh, a bigger problem. We have record spending, Mr. Speaker. They're unable to control it. They refuse to control it. And it's kind of interesting, you know, even those that they believe in Keynesian economics over there on, on spending when times are tough, what they miss on the other half time, and, and, and it is, we want the government to be able to keep spending in times that are tough, but they spend even more when times are good. The, the only limit <coughs> that they actually had, Mr. Speaker, and I often kind of chuckle at this, 
It's like giving a child a thousand dollars and saying you have a half hour to spend it, but you have to spend it in the dollar store. Well, it's not too far into the, the spending when the child realizes that, well, there's so many other things that I want. And they'd be, able, they'd be happy to save and go over there, but no, these are the parameters that you're in. You've got a $1,000, spend it the next half hour here in the dollar store. And that's what this government does. It has revenue come in, says we've got to spend it, it's burning a hole in our pocket. We can't put it into savings if we can spend it. And we look at some of those record revenue years, thank heavens there wasn't the capacity out there for them to spend any more. And they're actually forced to walk out of that dollar store and put some into our sustainability fund. And gratefully, that is sustaining us at this point where we don't have an actual debt, but we just have cash deficits accumulating now to, I think, $15.8 billion over the last five years. But Mr. Speaker, as we look through this, it, it's very disappointing that this government uh, comes year after year with its supplemental supply, and rather than be one or two ministries where there's been some action that's happened that, that's you know unexpected and needing some extra funds, that we have to come through this. But for a premier who says she's going to be fiscally responsible. Uh, she certainly has not demonstrated in any areas about some proper result-based budgeting. It's always next year. You know, the rainbow is just over the next hill. Uh, they don't seem to realize that that rainbow is a lot further away than that. In, in their budget and their revenue that they're projecting, it's just next year now. After five years, this is the fifth next year, the revenue is going to be here, and we're going to be back in the boom years again, so why do we need to worry about balancing the budget? It's, it's interesting that, that we continue to repeat this day after day, year after year, of not being able to control our spending. And it's a poor example. It's a poor example to Albertans. It's a poor example to <coughs> all of our public servants that, that work hard and, and create a better Alberta. But the lead is poor. That the number one message that this government and this premier has sent out to all of the working people in Alberta is that raises are in order. We deserve them and we'll restrain yours to a very limited amount. And they're unable to look at the domino effect of what a 2 or 3 percent raise has when it comes to the teachers, the nurses, the doctors, the policemen. <laughs> No raise? The government house leader says he's had no raise in five years. He doesn't remember his 30 percent raise, or maybe he was just uh, so heavy at the trough he couldn't consume any more if he wanted to. It's quite interesting, Mr. Speaker, that Bill 3, Appropriations Honourable Supplemental Member, Act, to Honourable Member, I uh, hesitate to interrupt.